we were talking about the B cells, just as he mentioned, and I think you also mentioned the cancer cells, how they have a higher um, susceptibility to mutation. Can you just explain what it is about them, about those cells that make them more susceptible? So why do certain cells in our bodies have higher mutation rates? And those two cells being like B cells in your immune system or those cells that be end up being cancerous? Mm -hmm. I can answer for cancer cells. So some of the mechanisms to prevent cancer would be like DNA repair mechanisms or some, some other mechanisms that recognize when uh, you know, there has been a mutation or something. And uh, cancer cells, some of the mutations may actually evolve, uh, involve eliminating that DNA repair mechanism. And just as a result of that, they mutate more. In the case of the B cells, it's probably a different system because they are actually undergoing this recombination of the genome. And that is just a built-in system for them to do that, but I actually don't know the details of how that works. So kind of by definition, a cancer cell is a cell that starts to mutate. That's one of the definitions. Of, so it, it, if a cell loses the ability to fix itself, it becomes precancerous. So it's sort of a cause and effect thing. Yeah, right at the back with the hand way up. Yep, they, madam. Um. My question is, because uh, digital and medical technology is actually evolving, I guess, in a way faster than natural selection can happen for humans, do some evolutionary biologists think that positive evolution has actually stopped? Uh, great question. So the question is, mm -hmm. given that we are engineer, if I can paraphrase, and you tell me if I'm wrong, if, if that we engineer our environments now, Right? So we're not responding. We create our environment because we can do that uh, to a great extent than most animals. And at a faster and faster rate, and this kind of alludes to this C-section idea, do some evolutionary biologists actually feel that, that adaptive evolution in humans is coming to an end? Is that? Yeah? Okay. I'd love to hear the answer to this. <laughs> well, there is actually... Most, most of the human population is actually doesn't have the opportunity to have this great medical care that we have over here. So that would be mostly a problem in westernized societies. But most of the rest of mankind is probably still subject to natural selection. But it, I think it is probably true that in, in, in societies where there is the, the kind of health care that we have here, that we have probably dampened the, the effect of evolution by natural selection, although I don't think we can... We have probably eliminated it completely, but it, it would probably be less effective than it would be if we didn't have the medical care that we have. Would you that there are some very prominent, uh, deep-thinking evolutionary biologists who do worry that we are building up um, a legacy of mutations to our detriment, that we are becoming, in a sense, genetically weaker. And these are not crackpots. So and I teach that, I tell my students that, and it's very difficult to say because the, of course, the, eugenic, the eugenics movement in the 30s was pan, right? Because it was like, there's no way. That's the flip side. But they, people have done models to suggest that in Western societies, you know, I'm carrying more mutations than I should be, really. That's good for me. Yes, right here in the middle. Uh, usage of viruses and your living organisms kill bacteria rather than antibiotics. Can you comment on that? So what about the possibility of you using other living organisms to um, combat bacteria rather than antibiotics? Yeah, there is some research using phages like viruses to fight bacteria. And, and the advantage with that is that those phages can evolve along with bacteria so that they wouldn't have the problem of antibiotics because they would evolve to keep up with the evolution of the bacteria themselves. And there is some research along those lines. So mm -hmm. Evolving medicine, I would. <laughs> Let me see, who have I not? Uh, have you asked a question already? Yeah, okay. Then I'll go up here to the lady again. Yeah. I was just wondering if there's a relationship between density of animals and their social groups and their ability to fight disease. Is there a correlation between being able to, or, or tending to live in social groups and the ability to fight disease across species? Oh, you're perfect. <laughs> Yes, yes, definitely. So, like, say, bees or ants, there's now some, some, some groups that are studying uh, different mechanisms that they have both to detect disease and control disease within the hives or within the colonies. So, yeah, yeah there is such a thing. I actually don't know the details of that, but I know that uh, I overlapped with uh, a couple of years ago with somebody in Germany who was at this institute who actually published a paper in this whole issue. Sylvia Kramer is her name. If you're interested in that, you could Google her name and you can find a paper she published in Current Biology on that topic. 
So it stands to reason that, of course, if you're in social groups, you're more likely to catch disease. That's the idea, right? From, that's the idea. So there should be stronger selection to evolve responses to deal with those diseases. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's right. the background. Yeah. Yeah.